Happy holidays, everyone. This season I felt like celebrating with a Victorian twist. That made me think of Charles Dickens and the Christmas Carol, because there is nothing more Christmassy than a ghost story. Remember, you can find Jackie Just Chatters on most mediums for podcasts and on YouTube as well. Maybe you'll give me a holiday gift and follow or subscribe, give a review or like, and share with your friends. Thank you to those who have been so supportive to my show. It means so much to me. For this episode, I partnered up with one of the hosts from the podcast East Coast Haunts, Mary Kate. I had such fun during our chats. It is always delightful to find someone who loves talking as much as myself. Because we are both talkers, I've decided to put this interview into two parts. Find yourself a warm drink, settle into your coziest chair, and join us as we go back in time to a wedding held on Christmas Day at the historic Brams Hill House in Hampshire, England. But things are not going to turn out as planned. See if you figure out the shocking twist the same time I did. I'm here today with my extra special guest that I'm super duper excited to be talking to, Mary Kate. And I'm going to get a stab at the last name here, Kaczynski. <laughs> yes, Did you I got get it right. It? Yep, perfect. Yes. Awesome. Okay, I'm doing good. Well, you hit the nail on the head. Thank you so much. So Mary Kate is one part of a duet that hosts the podcast East Coast Haunts. So welcome, Mary Kate. I'm so glad you could join me. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. This is going to be such a fun episode. It is. I know it right now because we had such a good chat before. It's guaranteed. The hard part will be like staying on topic. Absolutely. You guys have your podcast, East Coast Haunts. How did it begin? Sam and I, we are cousins. So we grew up together. We spent weeks together in the summertime. We were super close because we're so close in age. We would call each other and play video games over the phone. And we're one of, or we're two of six granddaughters on my mom's side. And so we all kind of grew up extremely close. I would say we're more so like along the lines of sisters than we are cousins. But Sam and I moved in together this past summer, August 2022, after I graduated from college. And by a stroke of luck or fate, if you believe in that kind of thing, we just ended up in the same area. And she had an opening in her apartment. So I moved in and it kind of just felt like we were kids again, back to doing, you know, things together. And we would bond at night by cooking dinner and we would discuss podcast episodes that we had both listened to that day at work. And then one day, one of us, I don't remember who it was, but one of us was just like, hey, you know, we could start a podcast because we have this banter going back and forth. It's a very comfortable conversation. And so we looked into starting a podcast. We Googled what you need to start a podcast and we did. And that's, that's pretty much the story. I mean, there's not much to it. I have to laugh because that sounds so much like my own story. Like, you know, <laughs> maybe I'm just going to do a podcast. That sounds exactly. like fun. And then you hit the Google machine and start looking at it. Honestly, it's too simple. Like, yeah. I think it should be harder because Honestly? any Yahoo could do it. Well, yes, and <laughs> there's kind of a few crazy podcasts out there, but I like to think that the podcasting community is, for the most part, pretty normal and people just wanting to share their knowledge and share things that they're interested in. But you're right. I mean, it's really doesn't take much to start a podcast. So when we get questions about it, it's more so just kind of like, well, figure out your niche, figure out what you're interested in and what you have to say and get a mic and start talking. <laughs> For the listeners, a little backstory, I guess. 
uh, we connected on this podcaster site, which sounds a lot cooler than it actually is. <laughs> and I, I had found their podcast and I checked it out. And I'm like, oh, this is fun stuff. And I was like, oh my gosh, we should get together and meet up because I really wanted to do a haunted Christmas episode. I've got Dickens on the brain. I'm thinking all Christmas Carol. I'm like, oh yeah. So so I reached out to Mary Kate and Sam and they were both like, yes, yes, we have to do this. You guys came to me with this fantastic story that takes place at Brams Hill House in Hampshire, England. So, okay, I'm going to full disclosure. I did hit the Google machine. No, I was careful. I did not look at any like history. I didn't want to know that stuff because I, I wanted you to surprise me and, and all that. But I did look at a bunch of pictures. Oh my goodness. That place is gorgeous. How stunning is that architecture? I mean, really, it is breathtaking. And the gardens. Oh, yeah. And then they have the fencing areas and they have the hunting boxes and the gardens and the lake. I mean, just it's. Have you watched Bridgerton on Netflix? Why, yes, I have. It's very much so a little bit reminiscent of that, I think. Oh, Bridgerton would fit there. Absolutely. They could film yeah. there. In fact, I don't know if you, I might be able to surprise you with something. They recently got approval from like the local council or whatever, permission to film at the house until March of 2026. So oh, really? like, what are they yes, um, it, they can do various projects. They either like just wrapped up or something like that. Matilda, the musical. They used the house. No way. Yes. No way. That is my sister's absolute favorite Broadway musical. And I was just telling all of my musical friends that I am so excited to see that movie because I really did love it on Broadway. That is so funny. Oh my gosh. That is so exciting. Oh my gosh. I cannot wait to watch that movie with all my Broadway theater friends and be like, well... Do you guys know a little bit of history about Brams Hill and just knowledge dump on them? Because that is my favorite thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing like a good knowledge dump. Absolutely. No, really? <laughs> okay. So give one to me. Knowledge dump okay. on me. Tell me about this house. If I can bring you way back to the early 14th century. So we're talking like, I think... The range of dates that they gave was a span of like 10 years from 1350 to 1360. And the entire house was built off a chapel that had existed since the 14th century. So this chapel was built first and then the entire house was built around it. Okay, and I saw pictures of the chapel. It's beautiful. Is It's gorgeous, right? And actually, the ghost story that we're going to be telling a little bit later has a little bit to do with the chapel. And the chapel is one of the most active parts of the house, so it's definitely an important player. Tell me more. So in March 1605, someone named Edward Lazoche purchased the property. He was a baron, and the property unfortunately suffered a fire, so he decided to demolish the property and remodel it. And he included a huge library, just the sprawling grounds. It was on... 262 acres of land so it's it's a massive estate so he was kind of the one that built it up into the glory that it is today and you can see like the architectural influences from the italian renaissance and it's just beautiful so anyone who's listening should google pictures of it because you really should have an image in your mind's eye and i can only do so much to describe it i'll find some links for pictures and stuff and put it in the description of the podcast episode. So for those of you who want to go look at them, you, you don't have to go hunting. I'll, I'll do that for you. So now you have no excuse. So go look at the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> and then someone named Sir John Cope 
purchased the house in 1699 and his descendants remained there until 1935. And now Sir John Cope was more, he was a very affluent man, but he is going to come in as a historical figure in the story that I'm going to tell as well. In 1935, it was purchased by the second Baron of Brockett and his name was Ronald Nall Kane. In fact, it was actually given up by him. It was acquired by the government and it was used as a maternity home during World War II by the Red Cross, which is fascinating, which I mean, it does have ample space. So not a bad place. I wonder how many babies were born there. I don't know. I wasn't able to come across it, but there is some sort of like um, a fictionalized account, fictionalized movie. I have to get the name about the babies that were born there. It's, it's Can you imagine, to- like, that's part of your story. It's like, I was born in this super posh yeah. <laughs> manor house. 15-bedroom <laughs> home. Yeah, it is, I mean, really. It, this this place is, has a really rich history. Acquired by the government, and it was used for police training in the 20th century. It kind of got hard to upkeep. It started to deteriorate a little bit in the hands of the government, and so the owners sold it to heritage property developers who restored the property to its former glory and in 2018 they put it up for sale it's still for sale and it's selling for 10 million euros right now the house itself as i mentioned earlier is 15 bedrooms it's 57,000 square feet it has a gorgeous like the the main features of the house are the drawing room and the library i want the library I know. Oh, I, I want know. the massive library. I would, never leave. I would never leave. It's gorgeous. It's time to get down to the ghost story. I have been waiting so to hear this. <laughs> I'm so excited. I don't think it's going to disappoint you. I really don't. I think it's going to live up to the hype because this is a ghost story that I myself grew up hearing. And I never really knew the origins of it. So when I was Googling like fun Christmas stories, fun Christmas hauntings, fun Christmas stories, I came across this and I was like, no way. I mean, really, this is such like a fun story, I think. Fun and ghosts. Not usually the word you expect to come together. I mean, you know what? As long as I think personally, I, obviously I'm not an expert in the paranormal. I've only been doing this for a few months. But I think that as long as you keep it respectful, paranormal stuff can be fun too. Absolutely. We have a blast doing the podcast. You know, just keep it respectful. Keep your practices safe. And I think it can be tons of fun. But this this story is really, it's not super gory or morbid. It's It's just... A classic ghost story that you could tell around a campfire. Well, the holiday season is upon us and we're we're gonna get our mold wine or cider or whatever and gather around the fire and let's let's hear this ghost tale. Great. Okay, so the ghost story that I have chosen is the is called The Legends of the Brams Hill Bride and the Mistletoe Bow. And so now Sir John Cope is going to come back into the picture and I'm going to introduce you to his daughter who is named Anne Cope. And Anne Cope was a young girl living in the early 18th century in Hampshire, England. And even though she was young, her wedding day was fast approaching. She was set to be married to one Hugh Bethel of Yorkshire, which was a matter that Anne had little say in. Anne did have a say in one thing. She had requested that her wedding take place on Christmas Day, which was her fr- her most favorite day of the year. The venue had, of course, been chosen for her, and it was to be her new estate in Bramshill House in Hampshire. So, hold on. She's getting yes. this house, the Bramshill House, as her wedding mm-hmm. present? She sure is, yes. Holy crap! I know. Okay. I feel a little... Um, you know, maybe my wedding gifts were were not quite <laughs> up to scratch to this level. I mean, I didn't get real estate for my wedding. I know. 
no, Come on, no one was handing me a home, let alone a 57,000 square foot home on Christmas Day. Well, I guess it's double because it's part Christmas gift and part wedding gift. So I guess they had to go big. Yeah, I know. Well, I mean, my parents, they gave me my first little used car for, for my graduation, birthday, Christmas, next year birthday gift. So <laughs> <laughs> so maybe this is kind of like covers her birthday presents and Christmas presents for the rest of her life. Maybe. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. <laughs> the next five lives. <laughs> her dad's like one and done. Perfect. Wow. Doesn't wow. have to think okay. about it for the rest of the time. That's that's a pretty amazing gift. Okay. All right. So <laughs> she's having the wedding at the house on Christmas Day, which I approve because Christmas is fantastic. Okay. Beautiful. All right. Continue. The crew of the house had decorated Bram's Hill for Christmas, and Anne couldn't help but be amazed at the endless amount of Christmas trees and decorations that adorned the halls. Garland wrapped every staircase and all the rooms were lit with the soft glow of countless candles. Anne was led to the chapel and the wedding ceremony seemed to pass by in a blur. She and her new husband exchanged vows and turned to face their small audience and bask in their nuptial bliss. Anne felt her spirit soar through the vaulted ceilings. She was on top of the world. Everyone took part in a grand reception and ate and drank and was merry, including Anne. She was beginning to think this new chapter of her life may be exactly what she had always hoped. And besides, Hugh wasn't bad looking either, and he seemed kind. Anne dared to hope that her life at Bram's Hill may be happy. If it can't be happy there, I, I don't know where it could be happy. Money can't buy happiness, but you know what? It probably feels a lot better to cry in a 57,000 square foot mansion than a little cottage, so. <laughs> you can rent it. You can rent exactly. happiness. Yeah, I think, you know you what? Can I buy think books. This you can buy all those books to fill the library. That's happiness. Exactly. Yeah, I think she might not have too much trouble entertaining herself in this house, so. No. At least she won't be bored. No. Okay, so she's having this party. She's she is bride extraordinaire. She's all bliss. This this is sounding wonderful. But I, it sounds I, great, I have right? a feeling there's got to be a problem because this is a ghost story. Just a small one. So Anne's excitement wavered when her mother began to push the two newlyweds towards the grandmaster bedroom that housed the marital bed. And Anne had no idea what awaited her in that room, which was typical of that time, but she felt butterflies bubbling up in her stomach. She wasn't quite ready and she needed a way to stall for just a few moments, just to compose herself and collect her thoughts before the biggest moment of her life up until that point. So before her mother could push her any further, Anne blurted out, wait, let's play a game. The wedding party happily obliged as everyone was in high spirits. Anne's mother shot her a knowing look, but agreed to a quick game of hide and seek. Anne would be given a five minute head start to find a hiding spot, and then the rest of the party would be freed to come and find her. Anne stuck around for a few minutes to ensure that everyone's eyes were closed and then dashed up the stairs, being careful not to tear her wedding gown or step on her veil. After five minutes had passed, the wedding party eagerly set out to find the bride. Hugh led the way with the rest of the guests in hot pursuit. The laughs and shouts of the party could be heard from every corner of the house, but as time passed, the laughs turned to whispers and concerned glances. No one could find Anne. Speculation was spread that she had run away from the stress of her new life. The party began to filter out of Bram's Hill with murmurs and questions until Hugh was all alone. As he lay down in, in what was supposed to be his marital bed, his head pounded. He was resolved to find his bride. Although he had only known her for a short while, Hugh did not believe that Anne would humiliate him like this. She was too kind and her heart was too pure. Hugh sat bolt right up in his bed suddenly. 
he could hear what sounded like pounding footsteps right outside in the hallway. He ran across the floor and flung open the door, but there was no one there. He did a quick sweep of the house, and there was no one to be found. He kept hearing the footsteps, although they seemed softer now. Hugh returned to bed and after hours of tossing and turning, fell fast asleep. The next two nights, Hugh was tormented with nightmares and the same pounding footsteps, although there was no one to be found. On the fourth night, Hugh was on the brink of a breakdown. He laid down and was greeted with the sound of silence. No footsteps, no pounding head, nothing. And for the first night since his wedding, Hugh slept peacefully. He comes into the bed, he gets this massive headache, and he hears the running. Yep. So we're guessing that something happened to her, that she hit her head, or somebody hit her on the head, and that she had ran by there in the hide and seek. Which, okay, I have to point out here i've never heard of hide and seek played this way like usually there's one person who like counts and then like a whole bunch of people go and hide and then they go find them so i thought she'd be doing the counting i didn't think that everyone else would count and then she'd go run off and they're like there's a whole group of people trying to find her that that seems a little unfair i mean that's like a posse coming for you I know. Maybe. Maybe they played it differently back then, but I will say I have played hide-and-seek like this before, but we called it um, salami. 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 Okay, so four nights of torment, and then he finally sleeps. Finally gets a good night of sleep. Okay, all right. Pick up your story again. I'm I'll interrupt you again. Guaranteed. Oh, absolutely. Please. So years passed with no sign of Anne. No one had heard from her since the night of the wedding. Not a single letter to her closest friends or family members. Mostly, people assumed she fled and started a new life. Maybe with a secret lover. Hugh remained at Brands Hill for years. He refused to leave and refused to accept that Anne had fled. He tortured himself with solving the mystery of his missing bride. As Hugh aged, his search slowed down but never stopped. He wasn't as vivacious as he once was, but he couldn't bring himself to give up. Hugh also could not bring himself to give up Brams Hill. He would walk the halls, remembering the joy that had not filled the house since his wedding day almost 50 years ago. For 50 years, he never remarries. He's wandering around. This lonely dude and 5,700 square feet, he's just wandering aimlessly, going like, Anne, Anne, are you there? Where are you? Like, yeah, I know. Wow. <laughs> it might be time. Dude, that, that guy needs a grief counselor really bad. Yeah, really. He needs a, he needs a, a friend to come in and help him get moving a little bit. He needs a vacation away from the house. I think you're right. I think that would probably do best. Like, I know Anne's going to end up being, like, the ghost in this story, but he sounds like he's the ghost in the house. He's haunting his own house right now. He is! He's totally haunting his house as alive. It's so sad. (laughs) But he's wasting away in there, and he's just torturing himself because he doesn't know. What happened to her? I know. It's, this is, that is, the sa- story has gone very sad. A little bit. It's, it, it has an interesting ending, though. I won't say it's a happy ending. But a few days before Christmas, Hugh received word of a family funeral he must attend. He set out in search of his mourning apparel, ignoring the snow falling outside the windows. Hugh could never bring himself to decorate for the holidays because it reminded him of Anne. With a heavy sigh, he entered into one of the spare rooms, and he could hardly bring himself to step across the threshold. This was the room that had briefly belonged to his bride. He swung open the closet and gasped. There was a hidden door in the back of the closet Hugh had never known was there. 
The door led to a staircase, which Hugh immediately began to climb. It took him several minutes to reach the attic at the top of the stairs, because he was not the young man he had once been. The attic was mostly bare, except for some old Christmas decorations and a large wooden chest. Hugh stepped closer to examine the chest. It was beautifully and intricately carved with an ornate gold latch on the outside. Curiosity won over, and Hugh heaved open the heavy wooden lid. I know it's coming. Oh, that's so terrible. Oh, it's <laughs> okay. Ready? Yep. Yep. Nothing could have prepared Hugh for the sight in front of him. His bride really had found the best hiding spot Brant Hill had to offer. Now her skeletal remains lay inside the chest, still dressed in her wedding gown. The inside of the lid was marked with deep scratches from where she had tried to claw her way out, but now she lay peacefully with a sprig of mistletoe clutched in her hand. Hugh clutched his chest as he thought of the first three nights after his wedding. Those footsteps hadn't been footsteps at all, but his wife's desperate pounding against her wooden coffin that she had become locked inside. Hugh stumbled backwards and tumbled down the stairs until he hit his head and everything went black. Oh, that's, oh my gosh, she was, I, I knew there had to be some significance to all of it. And so the whole time yeah. for those four days, she was stuck in that trunk and yeah. oh, oh, I know. that's so sad. I mean, and then, and then the idiot finally finds her and then falls down, and falls the, down stairs. the stairs immediately. Uh, yeah. He hasn't even told anyone that he knows where she is. Which is the worst part. He goes and kills himself. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you would think he would be able to stay alive long enough to maybe alert her family as to what happened. But at least he got some closure before he died. Yes. These are not safe people. They they need to be in a cottage. I agree. Because apparently a big house is too much for them. They couldn't handle it. Like they just don't know how to keep themselves safe. Yeah, really, really. Oh my goodness. Wow. I know. Quite a quite a little twist there, right? But we have we have a good ending coming, I think. Family members found Hugh a few days after his absence at the funeral, prompted them to go looking for him. They were horrified when they discovered Anne's body as well, but arranged to give the two lovers a proper burial. As the coffins were lowered into the dirt on the estate's ground, Anne and Hugh watched smiling from one of Brams Hill's windows, hand in hand and content to spend the rest of eternity together in their ancestral home. At the end. Okay, the, the ending is nice. My, my thought is, she's going to be like, dude, what took you so long? <laughs> She's like, come on, you couldn't find me in my own room? <laughs> right, like, how did he not go... When they, they did not inspect the house very well, no. is what I'm saying. He was there for 50 years like, and he never I get checked big, her room. But I'm like, at, at the time, they would have had a whole host of servants. Because you don't get a house like that without a bunch of oh, servants. No. You send them to check every room. Yeah, thoroughly. Like, this is some shoddy work. I think I think maybe the reason that they never found her was because there was like a ton of clothes in the closet. So when he went to go look in there for his morning apparel, then that was when he pushed it aside and noticed the door. But why would his morning apparel be in her room? I guess he couldn't find it anywhere else. Or maybe, I don't know. Yeah, I guess he couldn't find it anywhere else. He was searching right. all the rooms. Somebody had to put it in there at some point. Maybe her spirit. I can't did. imagine this was the first funeral he went to. Like I, I don't know. I, I, I'm certainly going too far into this and asking questions that don't need to be. Asked. No, they're good. So I do have a good question. Okay, so what kind of 
Like, were there ghostly hauntings afterwards? Have there been examples of of the two of them or one of them afterwards in the house? Oh, absolutely. I mean, and they are not alone. So, uh, Brams Hill is cited as being one of the most haunted houses in England. And there is one particularly haunted room. It's, clo- it's called the Florida de Lis room. And there are reports of a woman in white passing through the room. And she's often accompanied mm. by the scent of Lily of the Valley, which is apparently a perfume that Anne was quite fond of. And it came to the point that this haunting was occurring every night and so often that one of the residents of the room, Michael I of Romania, he was the last king of Romania, was staying in this room and actually requested to be moved to another room because the female spirit would disturb him and scare him at night, even though she was doing nothing but passing through. So she is spotted up and around up and around the the estate. And what's more is that the wooden chest is on display in the front entrance hall. No way. It's, it is. And is it closed or open? It's closed. So people speculate that it might be a replica of this, of the chest, but there are, are reports that say that it may be the authentic, the authentic deal. Well, my thought is you flip the lid open and, and you look for yeah. the marks of somebody trying to get out. Yeah. Like that would be pretty effective. Maybe, I know, maybe it's locked or something. I don't know. But I, it is probably pretty easy to check. Uh, but there is an apparition that is said to guard this wooden chest. It's guarded by an old man and he's either thought to be Hugh or the father of Anne. Oh. So that's cool. It is neat. So I I like to think that that's Hugh and that they are actually together and happy in their home that they never got to live in together while they were alive. Oh, so sad. I know it is sad. Now they're happy. I I think they're happy. I I choose to believe. That's the end of part one of my interview with Mary Kate. Part two will come out next week. I hope you enjoyed this Christmas ghost story. Next episode, we'll be talking some more about other ghosts that you can find at Brams Hill and Mary Kate's own personal experiences with the supernatural. If you want to know more about her or the house, please check out the links in the episode notes. Until next time, I wish you well. Well,